So to get us uh, started off tonight, um, I won't insult anyone's intelligence. You guys have all probably done too many Zoom calls at this point. And uh, if, if you're anything like me, um, you're a little bit sick of them, but it's the best way to communicate these days. So here we are. Um, so just a, a preface for kind of what we're going to be doing tonight. We're going to go over our uh, the Minneapolis City Future program tonight. Um, I've had a lot of conversations with a lot of different, um, we're, if you want to call it Minnesota soccer influencers, um, and had one-on-one -on -one conversations. But we also wanted to take an opportunity to uh, kind of host this webinar and, and talk about what our what this program is all about and, and kind of what our vision is um, because we want to take the, a collaborative approach. We want to work with everyone in Minnesota to try to continue to elevate, again, elevate Minnesota soccer. Um, so I, again, I just really appreciate everyone for taking a little bit of time on a Wednesday evening to join us. Um, we will we are recording, we'll send that out. So that will be available if you miss anything so you don't need to take diligent notes. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to throw those into the chat um, and we'll address those towards the end. Um, and, and the other piece is obviously just uh, keep yourself muted uh, for the presentation. So during the presentation, we're gonna talk a little bit about, you know, who we are, if, the, if you're not really familiar with, you know, who we are and what we do. Um, we're going to talk about, you know, what the purpose of the program is, what it actually is, and then, you know, what that impact is on, uh, on you as a soccer leader. Um, you know, how can you help your players if it's something that you're interested in? And obviously, we'll be fielding questions at the end. Um, and, and frankly, if you have any feedback for us, that would be wonderful. So the first part, and many of you are probably familiar with Minneapolis City, but maybe you aren't because we're relatively new. Um, we came around in 2015, uh, played our, our first inaugural season in 2016. Um, we're a community-based and member-driven 501c3 nonprofit soccer club, um, and we're run by an all-volunteer staff, right? So the, the, the true foundation of what Minneapolis City was was a... a um, amateur um, amateur organization called Stegmans, right? And Stegmans was in MASL, MRSL, and they've grown to, you know, up to six to seven teams, well over 120 members. Um, and they, just a, a few guys, uh, one of our founders is on the, on the call here, John Bisworm. And that just well organized and was getting a lot of tops Minnesota soccer players into playing and continue to kind of look at the U.S. soccer landscape and say, you know, are we able to be a little bit more organized and do this a little bit better? The other piece is that we saw a gap in Minnesota. Um, so I, I spoke, you know, just brief interaction here with John Lowry, like before, uh, just, uh, you know, a few weeks ago, um, Minnesota doesn't, didn't have a D1 program. Um, and so there was there was a gap when you come out of youth soccer um, or even if you're in US, uh, in youth soccer as a 17, 18, 19 year old, sometimes things can kind of fall apart. That happened to me personally when you get to the U18 level and you just didn't have a lot of club options to play. Um, and so going into my first year of college, I'd put on a little weight in that summer. I wasn't playing as much. Um, I had found some Mexican Ecuadorian leagues to play in, but it wasn't the same level um, that I was accustomed to. And so it, it, it didn't set me up for a ton of success in a critical, in a critical year for my development. So filling in that gap has always kind of been the biggest thing for Minneapolis City. Right now we have um, a Minneapolis City, our first team that plays in the NPSL, which is in the fourth tier of the American Soccer Pyramid. Um, we have Minneapolis City 2 that plays in the UPSL, which is in, technically in that same tier. Um, and obviously we have that Stegman's arm as well that is our founding branch. Um, we've kind of 
created Minneapolis City as a true community club in that well, there's a lot of community engagement. All of our players are required to do service. Um, so we've worked with y YMCA, Big Brothers, Big Sisters. We've done a lot of different things in our community um, and we're going to be continuing to do so. We also, uh, I mean, where we've become successful, Minneapolis City, is that we were founded by guys that were really um, we're really good marketers. So digital content has been a big piece of who we are, uh, whether it's social media, esports, podcasts, um, we kind of do it all there. And, and then we also have, um, we also have a brick and mortar club shop over in South Minneapolis off of uh, 38th and Hiawatha, uh, right by the Cardinal bar, if anyone's familiar. So, um, there we do a lot of team wear and apparel and merchandise um, because again uh, marketers that have done a, a lot of really good stuff in that in that space and so why not continue to do it okay so at, at this juncture what i'm going to do is so you know again and maybe I didn't introduce myself properly, but my name's Adam Pribble. As the general manager and technical director with Minneapolis City, um, I, I've had the distinct pleasure of working with a unique coaching staff that is frankly giving up a lot of their time um, that they could be doing coaching in other programs, definitely making more money because we don't pay our coaches anything. Um, and they've come to us with a you know, because they're looking for uh, an organization based on mission and values that reflect, you know, what they're looking for. Um, and so, uh, you know, at this point, I'm going to kick it over to Jeremiah Johnson. Jeremiah came to us about a year and a half ago, um, and maybe a little bit even longer ago, when, where him and I started having discussions um, on this notion of what could a U19 program look like in, in the Twin Cities. And so we've been working back and forth since then. And really, uh, what you're going to see here is a, the brainchild of Jeremiah that, that we've fine-tuned over time. Um, so uh, I'll, uh, I'll move it over to Jeremiah Johnson, who is the head coach of the Futures program. All right, thanks, Adam. So uh, we're gonna we're just gonna go through the, the purpose of the program, um, go through some of the details of the program, why we're why we're doing it, how we're doing it, um, and then what's gonna happen next. So we'll just dive right into you know what the purpose of the Minneapolis City Futures Program um, is. And and before before I get into this, um, just a little bit of background. So about uh, I think it was October of two thousand and eighteen. Um, the club put out a vote to the members on whether they wanted to add a U19 level to the club that already had a U23 level and a full first team. Um, that came back with a resounding um, yes uh, vote. Um, and then since October 2018, uh, we've been examining on how, what the best way to, to add that particular level into the club and do it the right way. Um, uh, there, there was an initial goal of adding that U19 level in 2019, um, but we were honest with ourselves at that point uh, in the beginning of 2019 and said, you know what, we're not ready. We need more time to do this the right way. So um, since that point, we've been examining um, what the members want out of a, uh, a U19 type level. Um, what, what we wanted as coaches, as, as administrators. And so what we did is we, we really tried to examine the U.S. soccer landscape and find out where the problems were specific to the state of Minnesota and, and the Twin Cities. So the, the purpose of the program, as, as Adam kind of touched on, is to bridge the gap for Minnesota's most promising players between the youth level and adult whether it's amateur or professional soccer. And there's a gap there. So here are the four problems that we're attempting to solve. So the first problem is structure. We've kind of touched on it a little bit. So the opportunities for those players that are earing, nearing that 18, 19, 20 year old age range often fall apart or they just 
flat out don't exist outside of college soccer, especially at the elite level. Um, and then many of those players at that age group will lose interest because there's really not another competitive level of soccer at their youth club beyond U19 to which to aspire. And what that creates is just another problem where many youth clubs in Minnesota have a tough time um, putting together teams at that U19 level. And I can, I can speak personally to this. Um, I was on a college campus playing division one when I was 17 years old. I came back that summer, my club had already started. I really didn't have anywhere to go. And somebody who was playing at a, I guess a collegiate elite level, um, I felt like I took a half step backwards because I ended up playing for a community club and it really just, it wasn't the structure that I needed to continue to propel forward and move forward, um, you know, towards my eventual goals. So the first problem we're trying to solve is that structure, just filling that age level gap. Um, the second problem we're trying to solve is expense. So we've done a market analysis uh, as part of this, um, as part of the planning for this program. And we found that the cost of elite level soccer between ages 16 and 19 can exceed $4,000 a year. It, uh, for the Twin Cities, a uh, typical youth club can range from $1,800 to $3,600 a year per player to play. At a, an elite level, that could be $6,300 or $10,000 for a player to play um, elite level uh, soccer in this particular age group. And what happens there is, is that this cost can exclude talented Minnesota players who do not have the financial means to participate. Uh, so it essentially shuts them out of the U.S. soccer system. Once again, another personal um, story. Um, I would have not been able to play elite level youth soccer in the Twin Cities in the, the in 2020. It just wouldn't have happened. I my my parents. My dad was a mechanic. He made thirty to forty thousand dollars a year. There was no way we were going to be able to spend four to ten thousand dollars on me to go to play um, soccer at some level. So my dream would have stopped right there. So there are many of those players out there. So this is one of the other problems that we're attempting to solve. Third problem, time and travel. Um, elite teams typically involve extensive travel. Um, for example, if you want to uh, go play a tournament, a uh, showcase tournament in just Kansas City, which is one of the closest markets that are more popular for Minnesota players to play at, um, you're talking about a potential 13 hour round trip drive to go play, you know, two 90 minute games in which the, a particular player might play 50% of those minutes. So many of those Minnesota players often spend more time traveling than playing on the field. Um, and the 20 and under age group also have jobs and other social commitments that start to make some of that travel prohibitive or just plain undesirable. And we, we, we run into a participation problem there as well, or a priority problem. Fourth problem, roadmap. Um, so an immediate jump to division one in USSF and United States Soccer Federation, or even abroad is often unattainable. Uh, ESPN published a story uh, about a year ago um, that took a look at all the players under the age of 22 and the percentage of minutes that they were getting at the MLS level. And it, it, it came out that only 2% of the overall minutes in MLS were being dedicated to players under 22 years old. So very, very few players can make that immediate to jump to MLS and get, and get minutes. Um, if, if you look at the Premier League, uh, I think 4% of the minutes are going to players under 22, under 22. And if you look at the first division in France, it can be as much as 9%. So um, we've kind of got a domestic problem there where we're not, we're not nurturing um, the players at the younger levels. Very, very few players from Minnesota have been able to make the jump to division one, um, whether domestic or abroad. I can think of just a handful, um, you know, Leo Cullen, Tom Prestis, Jackson Ewell, and maybe a couple other players that have actually been able to make that jump. Everybody else has had to be nurtured through the ranks. So the bulk of Minnesota players lack awareness that Minneapolis City 
exists and that there's competitive play opportunities even outside of Minneapolis City at the NPSL and UPSL level that may exist for them to continue their careers beyond high school club and college. So that is the fourth problem that we're attempting to solve. So getting into the meat of this, so what is the Minneapolis City Futures program? So this is our value proposition. Uh, it's a competitive intra-club soccer environment designed to nurture players for the demands of college pro and professionally amateur soccer without the typical cost and travel demands required by the U.S. soccer system. So the, the Futures program is attempting to solve those four uh, problems. Um, it's important to note that this program is supplemental to the current existing club and high school environment. We are attempting to augment um, and, and provide additional opportunities for those players who are already in those environments. We are by no means are trying to compete with players. We're trying to bridge a gap for those players. It's also important to note that we're trying to create an environment um, so we've got some incredible coaches uh, at the club and high school level in the state of Minnesota. I know many of you, um, you guys are doing a great job. We are not trying to take players. We're not trying to replace the work that you're already putting in, but what we are trying to do, and John's going to speak to this a little bit, is we're creating an environment that is ultra competitive, that is necessary for those players to continue moving forward. Once again, I cited uh, a personal experience a, a moment ago about how I came back from college and I just didn't have the right environment. So part of what we're doing, a big part of what we're doing is creating an ultra competitive environment to allow these players um, to continue to move forward. For the club, and uh, th this, is, this is a little bit selfish, but we want to win a national championship with only Minnesota-based players. And in order to do that, we know that we need to make all of Minnesota soccer better. So we are fully aware that as part of the Futures program, and I'm going to get into the details here in a second, um, as part of the Futures program, we might be developing players for other programs that players may go elsewhere, whether that's USL, a layer, uh, another layer such as MLS, or other UPSL or NPSL squads or somewhere, some other acronym. That's okay. We know that we need to make um, Minnesota soccer better. So that's really the purpose of the selfish purses, purpose of what Minneapolis City's Futures Program is all about. Uh, before we get into specifics, uh, I'm going to bring in John Bisworm. John Bisworm is one of the founding members or, or founders of Minneapolis City. Um, he's also the sporting <laughs> director uh, for Minneapolis City and um, is often the initial touch point for some of the new recruits. So he's going to talk a little bit about who exactly um, the Futures program or what type of players the Futures program is going to serve. Thank you, Jeremiah. Um, so I, what I want to fir first start off with is the fact that <clears throat> from 2015 into 2016, when we did start competitive play, the, the development aspect of players that might fall in this age range was something that we've actually always done. We've just never really put like a a well-organized moniker or, a, or built the program around it. Um, I, I, I was doing the math uh, this morning in preparation for my, my slides today, and <clears throat> over one-third of our first roster in 2016 was under the age of 21. So we were already, in some instances, piloting the model of what can happen when we take uh, the top tier of a certain age group of soccer players in Minnesota and how successful we can actually be with that without intentionally developing a program, <clears throat> excuse me, a program that is geared towards just that. Um, and then throughout the years, we've always had players that have either been supplemental, supplementally training with us that may already have been within your program, but they were coming to train with us from the 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. slot when we do train. Um, and, but again, we weren't just, <clears throat> we weren't putting any, any title behind it. Um, we were just trying to collectively put all of the best players um, together. One other thing I wanted to, to touch on before, before we get into this a little bit too is that uh, the way globally that soccer clubs foster quality talent is to put it all together. 
And that then helps you identify the players that you can move on to the next level that then go throughout your program or in other countries, um, or in some instances, our country, you can sell those players for a profit. But for, for our intents and purposes, if we are going to continue to, to, to strive for that goal of elevating Minnesota soccer and selfishly wanting to win a national championship with only Minnesota players, it, like Jeremiah said, it starts at this level. So as far as what the program and, and who the program serves, we're looking for anywhere between the top 40 and 50 Twin Cities-based soccer players below that 20, uh, that, that 20 age range that have that aspiration to continue playing soccer beyond being a teenager. Um, it, it isn't for everybody, you know, and, and obviously a program like this will be for the players that have a certain talent level that we deem is high enough to be part of the program, which will be vetted out through the, through the tryout process. But these players um, might have a, a couple characteristics that, um, that we, we kind of workshopped or we, we spoke to people within this age range and, and maybe some, a few parents that, uh, that had some input. But um, number one here is that a lot of players require an accelerated environment to prepare them for college soccer. And that's kind of where we started with bringing in the younger players into our adult soccer, um, under our adult soccer umbrella, was to, to prepare them. Um, Ian Smith, who was a, a, a 17 going on 18 year old, made our first team. Um, played significant minutes in our first season as a defensive center midfielder and then went on to pretty much have a handle on the defensive center midfield spot from day one at the University of Green Bay. If, if you would like to talk to him, the first thing he'll tell you is that day one moving into campus, playing with us that summer gave him the competitive advantage over every other freshman that came in. And that, that is how he coupled his already existing foundation of quality soccer skills, but he added the level of, of um, preparedness that we gave him by introducing him to uh, a model that, that had bigger, faster, stronger players than him. Uh, number two, there's a desire for higher level competitive, um, you know, situation um, to augment current club or high school environments. You know, like Jeremiah and, and Adam said, everyone on this call is doing a fantastic job already helping foster the talent. Um, I'd say close to 100% of the, the talent we already have in our, our, um, our adult level has come through a program that you are probably part of or were part of at one point. But there are some, some people that, that fall within this age range that they may only play club soccer or, um, or they may only play high school soccer, but they have the talent level because they can't afford, like Jeremiah's example, to play a high level elite uh, uh, club soccer model. Um, so we have to look at those people who, who desire that higher level, are prepared for that higher level and give that to them. Another aspect is the Olympic Development Program. It's not that similar from what we're proposing to create for this age range, um, but that level of program stops at this age group where those players need something else to be, to be put into, again, to, to give them that competitive environment that is supplemental or maybe even the only thing that they do that prepares them for the next step if they have the skill sets to, to move to the next step. Uh, Sometimes people can't afford or justify the cost of playing competitive high-level soccer. We've touched on it a couple times. It is a very real thing. Um, it's, it's in every market. And I don't know many markets that are trying to really um, latch on to the, to, to the folks that are underserved and give them an opportunity. And we'll talk a little bit later on about how um, the, the high cost of, of soccer, um, how we plan to, to help kind of bridge that gap when, when Jeremiah talks a little bit further about the program. <clears throat> he also talked about the justification of sometimes traveling isn't in the cards. Um, it, it can be an added cost. And if, if parents who can't afford it are already spending the money they have earmarked for the, their child to play in a high level environment, the, the couple hundred dollars on a weekend to travel um, isn't feasible. Um, so we, we definitely want to, to, be, to be mindful of the fact that, that that travel commitment is a real thing. And outside of all of the other commitments that Jeremiah had mentioned, jobs, um, other social commitments, we, we, can't, we can't turn, a, turn an eye to that. It, it, it is a real thing. Uh, some of these, these players don't feel that maybe the traditional system offers them what they need. And that's not a slight on what's already being offered. It's just the perception of, of certain 
certain kids and their parents in, in the current landscape. And, and we've all seen that player who maybe at the 15, 16, 17 level, they were a good soccer player, but and maybe, maybe they had something like they, their, their ability to, to read and dissect the game at a, at a high level was there, but maybe their body or their, or their refined skills have, haven't quite caught up yet. But then you see them at 18, 19, and they're playing in a different environment, and you're like, I remember that kid. Um, that's a real thing. There are, there are late bloomers, um, and, and there are some that are overlooked um, you know, all over the place, especially within, within our market. And some of those folks, they're, they're, they get lost within the U.S. soccer system. You know, they might not be aware of what else is out there. Um, and this program is definitely geared towards making sure that, that they aren't forgotten. And the last thing, <clears throat> talented young players deserve the chance to play at a high level, um, whether it's collegiately, um, whether it's semi-professional, professionally amateur, like we call ourselves, or full professional, um, but they might need that time to develop in those environments. You could have a player at the division three, two or one level, or even NAI or junior college level that has the skill sets and the desire and, and, and the willingness to put the work in to become a professional, but they need the time within that environment to develop. Uh, so all of these, these factors we feel contribute into kind of who that ideal candidate is for being part of our futures program. All right. Thanks, John. That was awesome. Um, so we're going to get into the details of what the futures program actually consists of. So there are three primary components of the Minneapolis City Futures Program, and they work in tandem to help us solve or attempt to solve all the four problems that we've identified at the beginning of this presentation. So the first component of the Minneapolis City Futures Program is what we call the futures training. It's pool training for those 40 to 50 players, and I'm gonna get into that in a little bit more detail in a, in a subsequent slide. Um, there's the Futures League, um, which is an intra-club competition that we are all very, very excited about. And we are actually um, piloting with our, uh, our first and second team folks over the fall because of COVID. Um, and then the third piece is what we call the Futures Friendlies. It's, it's where we pull a handful of those players uh, together that are showing the most promise in that moment um, and put them out there for some external competition. So futures training. So, you know, what does that look like? All of you guys are coaches. So you're going to examine this at somewhat of a granular level. So what we're doing is we're pulling those 40 players into a pool training format once per week. And we're really the, the focus of that particular training is focus on foundation. It's a focus on fundamentals and just driving that stuff home. So when they can potentially advance to be part of a Minneapolis City second team or a Minneapolis City first team, um, that they have all of those things ingrained to the level in which we are satisfied with. Because if you get into a Minneapolis City first team training and you can't, you can't pick up an advanced topic because you don't have that foundation, that's going to be an issue. So if you can't receive a ball across the body, something as basic as that, um, or move off the ball or be able to deliver a pass with the proper speed and the proper weight, you're gonna have a very, very difficult time in a first team training where we're focusing on breaking lines. So futures training is a focus on the foundation and the fundamentals. It's also a focus on uh, um, implementing some of the playing principles that um, are unique to the Minneapolis City first and second team. And th the purpose of that is to make sure that, that that transition in between the levels is going to be um, somewhat seamless. So that's going to be the, the, the focus of uh, uh, the futures training sessions. The second component is uh, what we call our futures league, and it might be the, the sexiest part of the Minneapolis City Futures Program. Um, we, uh, so 
the first couple dates that we get our players together, we will be doing identification sessions. We will do our best to select the top 40 or 50 players. We'll bring them into a pool training environment um, until mid to late December. And then we will break off for a holiday break. During that holiday break, we are going to be dividing up all of those players into four different seven V seven teams that are representing different neighborhoods um, throughout Minneapolis. And, you know, so why, why are we doing a league, an intra club league? So we're trying to solve that problem of travel and we're also solving, trying to solve that problem of expense and we're putting them into an ultra competitive environment. Why seven V seven specifically? Because it's fun. It's awesome. 7v7 is the most fun that I've ever had playing soccer, whether that when I was 14 before we got into high school level or when we were in college and traveling around the southeast to different colleges and playing um, our spring season was 7v7 tournaments on the weekend. And it is awesome. It is um, amazing the, uh, the speed uh, that you can get out of a, uh, a 7v7 environment, you're essentially taking an 11v11 environment and compressing it into a smaller space um, with a, a few less players. And then much like futsal, you're exponentially getting more touches. So uh, once again, selfishly for our coaching staff and our, our video analysis folks, uh, we're going to be able to take all of that content and evaluate it and be able to look at all of these players that are playing um, within within the futures league and i mean we're, we're really excited about this as, as a player i would have loved to be a part of something like this um and and we're, we're we're really excited about where we can where we can take this and like i said a moment ago we're actually piloting this idea with the first and second team um uh during our fall trainings uh, because we can't play any uh, competitive games so the second component of the Minneapolis City Futures program is uh, the Futures League. Jeremiah, do you mind if I say one piece there? Yeah, go ahead. I was pretty sure I missed something. The, one of the other reasons that the 7v7 model and, uh, you know, looking mostly at six players plus a keeper is – too many times when we've reached, and this is the technical director piece of my job, is when players reach us at the first team, second team level, um, you know, they, they feel that they're specialized in one position. Um, and we have moved guys into different positions that they've arguably been more successful at. And so breaking down some of those barriers and, and because this happens at every level and it's not a good or a bad thing, but a coach says, this is, this is what you're playing. Um, and because that fits that certain team dynamic, but a, a seven V seven model, you kind of have to play three different positions. You have maybe a general area of the field you're in, but you're, you're, you're not set in this certain position that, you're stuck in. Um, and so you start to develop some different skills and you see the game in a slightly different way. So that's where we feel that it developmentally, it's going to help the players. Yeah. And that, I... that actually, that actually reminds me of one of the points that, that, that I wanted to make. So w once again, why seven V seven. So we're compressing that environment, more touches, but in a seven V seven environment, we can also um, get the same type of looks uh, p uh, at positional roles that we would in an 11 V 11 type environment. So, we can get a look at those uh, players who are more comfortable in a center back role in a seven V seven environment. We can take a look at the player who is uh, traditionally a central midfielder in a seven V seven environment. We can get a look at the striker role in a seven V seven environment. And then those players that are out wide in a seven V seven traditional formation, those players uh, essentially represent not only attacking wingers, but also those uh those wide fullbacks that can get up and down the field so um 7v7 is uh, a great environment to once again compress it get more touches but then also take a look at um uh, what would still be traditional uh, positional roles that you would find in 11v11 go ahead john sure. Um, I was just going to add one thing that when you talk about this being a supplemental model for the players you currently have in, um, you know, we do know that there's going to be players that, <clears throat> excuse
excuse me, uh, aren't yours because they already have aged out of your program, but there are going to be some that are, are using this as a secondary um, option to, to gain more games and more touches. Um, if you think about the current landscape, um, this is a, a controlled environment for players that you, that you currently also work with. It's not them going out and playing in a CSC league. It's not them going out in, in more of a kick around model. This is highly structured with a full training staff in case there's any injury. Um, there, it's, it's better for us to add that competitive layer for these players that are, are, we're essentially borrowing from you um, in this type of environment and giving them that competitive piece. Just wanted to kind of layer that on top. So they're probably already out there doing something that, that they could really get hurt in that is less structured. Yeah, and another, another cool thing about this that I think is, 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 is worth highlighting is, so in, that, in the pool training environment, we will have um, staff coaches like myself to run those sessions. When we get into a futures league environment where there's four different teams and we've got 40 different players, somebody like myself will take a step back and take more of uh, an umbrella role. And what we're going to do is we're bringing in player mentors from our first two teams to be, um, be inspiration sources, be those mentors for the players of these individual teams um, because they're the current players that are in it uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. And the message from somebody like that might resonate a little bit more with somebody who's 19 or 20 years old rather than somebody like myself who's 45 and used to be there. So um, that's another really, really cool thing that we've got going on as part of the Futures League is those mentor players will have uh, a, a, a full officials uh, running those, the Futures League. And then we'll, like, like John said, um, we've got a relationship um, with Twin Cities Orthopedics and we'll have um, certified athletic trainers at every single session. So that's, that's the Futures League. This is, this is the funnest part. Anything else that we need to add before we move on? Okay, okay cool. Okay, the third component is the Futures Friendlies. So we've got 40 players that are participating in regular pool training. We've got 40 players who are participating in the intra-club ultra-competitive Futures League. From that, uh, we will be taking the top 18 to 20 players on a rolling basis, who's ever performing best in the moment, and we will invite them into a futures friendly match. And what we're going to be doing over the course of uh, roughly February, March until June or July is scheduling friendlies for the Minneapolis City Futures first team, if you will. Um, we, as part of our financial model, we've, uh, we're, we're slated to host up to four matches in 2021. Um, and we are looking to play against uh, opponents such as the first and second team for Minneapolis City um, and other external opponents. Um, and I, I won't get into specifics on, on who we've played, but, or who we will play, but it, would, it will probably uh, be paralleled to many of the opponents that uh, Minneapolis City plays um, at the uh, at the at the first and second team level. Um, there's a there's also an opportunity um, for especially these particular players to be called up to a NPSL or a UPSL roster. Um, so it, as as part of the pool training, we'll be stacking that training from a scheduling perspective. So there might be an opportunity where we've got a player who is just lights out and might be younger but we will invite them and say, invite them into a first team training and just see, all right, you, you interested? Let, let's see how you can hold up um, against some of these players who have played in Europe or played um, in the USL or their, you know, collegiate all Americans. And um, that's, that's really uh, an additional layer to this where these players are going to be able to thrive. And then as part of the futures friendlies, we're going to be opening these up to, uh, uh, from a spectator perspective to college coaches, pro scouts, to observe these younger players um, and observe uh, the futures. Anything else you want to add there, Adam? No, um, except that the, as we look at bringing players into different facets of the organization, whether it's training, um, future or friendlies 
paramount to us is going to be communication with families and an existing, whether it's clubs, high schools, college, right? Um, we're always going to be compliant within all the different various rules, like you can't play during a high school season, college season, all these different pieces, but we want to be really working closely with families and coaches to make sure that not only are we doing the best thing for player development, but that we are being really respectful of, you know, time and, and different obligations that families have. So um, that we'll always be keeping a close eye on that as well. Awesome, thank you. <clears throat> so what's in it for the player? So as far as I know, and I'm pretty versed on the U.S. soccer landscape, this is a one of one of a kind program in the nation. Um, the components that comprise the Minneapolis City Futures program, um, in collectively, it, it's pretty unique. Um, uh, players, this is super important. Players can continue to play with their club teams, high school squads, and college programs. Um, that's a very important piece of the Minneapolis City um, Futures programs. Uh, kids want to play with their high school. Um, we, we know that from, you know, many of the conversations that go online in regards to the U.S. soccer landscape with both boys and girls. Um, so that's an important piece to us. Um, these players are getting eight months of regular training in a high level environment. Um, the league is fast paced, ultra competitive um, with uh, many, many touches in a 7v7 format. And like I said, we've been piloting this with the first and second team for our fall league. Um, and uh, they are having a blast with it. It's, it's super fun to watch and it is hyper competitive. Um, these players will have an opportunity to feature in those exhibition games. Um, they'll get a Minneapolis city training kit and futures league Jersey. Um, you can see a couple of those visuals on the screen. And if you've been on soccer Twitter, you may have seen them um, already. Um, every one of our events is going to be monitored by a cert certified athletic trainer. We want to make sure that we're taking care of these players. Um, the, every event is going to be, have guidance from the Minneapolis city coaching staff, not just at the futures level, but from the first and second team staff as well. These players are going to have access to those player mentors, as I mentioned earlier, from the first and second team. Many of those players on the first and second team are already youth coaches working within some of the clubs that you guys are already at or at the colleges that you guys are already at. Um, uh, every player is going to uh, become a member. They're going to be legitimately becoming a member of Minneapolis City um, with voting rights. Um, they're a member of the club. They're going to get exposure to those college and semi-pro scouts. Um, they will have a path to professionally amateur. Um, in our senior NPSL and UPSL squads. Um, one thing I didn't note um, in this earlier slide is as part of the league, um, those, those players are going to be getting exposure on the Minneapolis City website. We're gonna be updating rosters. We're gonna be updating stats. Um, we will have end of season awards, um, you know, best goalkeeper, um, golden boot winner, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's gonna be really, really fun. Um, solving one of the problems that we say at the beginning, um, there's no travel as part of this. Um, it's all local. And then one of my mottos is, is that it's an opportunity to make some magical memories. Um, when you do something remarkable um, with somebody you've developed a relationship with, you're going to develop a magical memory that's going to last you your entire life. So those are the player benefits. And so you're probably thinking, okay, this all sounds great. Um, it's well thought out, um, but won't a program like this be super expensive? So this is, this is what um, it looks like from a, pro, a program cost and scholarship um, perspective. So we have some absolutely amazing members um, that have allowed us um, through their membership and um, through some of the other things that the club does that we are able to subsidize some of the costs for this type of program. And then in addition to that, um, we have built in as part of the program scholarships for at least 20% of the players. Unfortunately, um, pay to play is a reality in US soccer. 
It's never going to completely go away, but as part of this, we are doing our best to minimize it. One of those ways is our awesome members, um, some of the subsidies from the club, and then our staff is primarily all volunteer. Um, and that takes away huge expense um, for putting together a program like this. So um, uh, we're going to be running uh, tryouts or trials or player identification sessions, whatever you want to call them, um, in, in November. Um, we're looking at a trialist fee of uh, targeting $135 per player. They're going to get three indoor sessions. We all know how much indoor sessions cost. An athletic trainer at every single session. Uh, we've got coaches that are volunteering as part of those player ID sessions. Um, there's no markup um, or margin applied for the club administration. Every player is going to get a, a trialist jersey. Um, every player that trials with us is going to become a member of the Crows. They're going to become a Minneapolis City member. Um, and then we still have built in as part of the financial model scholarship awards for at least 20% of those trialists. Um, so we, we, we want to make this as inclusive as possible. And on the first and second team, we do the same thing. Um, it's not that difficult to have a little conversation with us and we'll make sure that um, we get those players in. Uh, from a program perspective, so uh, November until June, uh, the program cost is targeted at $845 per player. Um, like I mentioned earlier in the, in the presentation, we did a market analysis of all the different clubs in the Twin Cities throughout the region, other NPSL clubs, other UPSL clubs, and other um, uh, clubs of, of, of note that we respect uh, across the nation. And we identified one of them that was our target in terms of what they are doing from a cost perspective for their academy level. Um, they are heavily subsidized by sponsors, but we felt that we were going to do the best job we could um, from an administrative perspective to get to that number. And so $845 for a program is the lowest that you're gonna find for an elite program in the Twin Cities at this level. Um, the program, like what we talked about, it's gonna consist of four Futures League teams, indoor facilities from November to May, and then we might jump outdoor in June and July. Athletic trainer at every single event. Um, we're working in a stipend for some of our coaches and mentors. We'll have a mild uh, uh, club administration um, margin put in there just so we can maintain it. Um, it's going to include those future league jerseys and a full training kit, jersey shorts and socks. We're going to have goalkeeper jerseys. We've built in a glove allowance. Um, we've got at least two former goalkeepers, three former goalkeepers on this call, and we all know how much gloves can cost, so we've built that into the, the program as well. Uh, scholarships awards full, made available for at least 20% of the players. And then to ease it even more, Adam has worked in um, the ability to set up a payment plan so it drops below $100 a month. So um, that's what we're looking at from a program costs and scholarships perspective. Adam, you want to add anything there? The only, I, you know, the one of my favorite ideas that Jeremiah came up with as a part of like the trialist fee and, you know, is that every trialist when you come out um, in November, hopefully, um, with the pandemic, is that anyone that comes out as a trialist walks away becoming a Minneapolis City member. Um, and that's a big deal to us because, you know, every year we have at least two to three open trials, um, and those have always filled up um, and so, you know, every year we're, we're walking away with 120 players coming out and trying out for us and, 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 and they all kind of fall in love with the club. And so we want them, um, to feel that they're a part of it. And so that's going to be, that's going to be part of that trialist fee. Um, and, and not that that added to the cost, but it's just built in be, to say that this is, this is a value that you get. So. Um, I just love that aspect and want to make sure to highlight it. Awesome. Uh, I'm going to pass it back over to John because he, uh, as our sporting director, is is often the first point of contact for uh, from a recruiting perspective. So, John, you, you want to talk about a little bit more about how um, the folks that are viewing this presentation are going to be able to help their players uh, with this particular program? Sure. 
So first and foremost, I, I want to <clears throat> be realistic that <clears throat> before we can ask you to to help us uh, help you, it's making sure that you guys fully understand the program itself and and why we're doing it and how and getting your buy-in that this is something that you feel is beneficial for the soccer community in Minnesota. Um, it, we talked about our our selfish reasons behind it, and and that's just. I love to win a national championship uh, with Minnesota-based players because uh, I'm not from Minnesota. I, I, I work here. I live here now. My kids are born here. Um, but when I was growing up in the Midwest and uh, in Wisconsin and Ohio, playing a against a team from Minnesota, in our mind, meant a an automatic three points and walking away with some sort of stat line. I, I don't want that anymore. And we want to make sure that you guys are comfortable with what we're doing first and foremost, before we, we ask you to, to introduce this to your players who have, who maybe haven't already reached out to us or to reiterate it to your players. So definitely anything that we can do uh, to help go over something uh, conversations to be had um, after this presentation, all three of our, our inboxes, our phone numbers, our doors are open. Um, please reach out because we want nothing more than to, to elevate Minnesota soccer. Um, and we think that this will help, but how you can directly help is really just that awareness piece. Um, you know, share your thoughts, not only with us, um, with other coaches, uh, within your programs, with families, um, with, with players that, that you think would benefit from this environment. And, and I think there, there's, that, that's twofold. There, there are some players that can benefit from, from being in this environment all in 100%. And there's also realistically some players that would benefit from the trial process and maybe not making it the first time. And that's okay. Um, I would love nothing more than having a repeat trialist for, at, the, at the early ages, maybe 17, um, come back at 19 and make, make the squad because it proves our point that there are are late bloomers out there, but there's some there's sometimes a need for a reality check in the soccer world um, that you might not be good enough right now, and that's okay. Keep at it, and this is the this is the the program that you should you should aspire to achieve for, and that chip on your shoulder that it didn't work the first time um, to have that aspiration to get there. Um, definitely wanted to mention that because it it isn't for everyone, but we want to try to make it for everyone. Um, even if it means that, that it might be later on down the road. So um, you can follow us on, on Twitter at MPLS City Futures. Um, you can, if, if you're comfortable with it, you can like, you can retweet, um, you know, you can, you can share your thoughts and tag us. Um, anything you can help us do to get the word out there is, is much appreciated. Um, and then once that happens, when you have those conversations with families um, or individual players, um, we will make sure that, uh, that you guys get the, the link to the interest form. Um, JJ, you'll have to tell us how many people so far we have, but even since we first launched the, the, the pilot program without the level of detail and we, and we put the interest form out there, it has gained a ton of traction. And that was, that was not speaking to folks like yourselves that have a vested interest in clubs. So we really want to make sure that we're getting um, the interest form out there um, to everyone so that we can, we can properly structure the trial process, make sure we don't leave any stone stones unturned. But JD, where are we at with so far with interest? Yeah. So I, I, th I think it's important to note that we've been very purposeful with how we've kind of rolled out the information um, regarding this program. Um, and been very deliberate about it. So, you know, our first step was was making sure that we we got the approval and all of our I's were dotted and, and T's were crossed and we got the approval from our member board. And then we presented this information um, and had a similar presentation with all of our membership for Minneapolis City. Um, after that, um, we wanted to make sure that we shared this with all of the soccer influencers um, the people that are on this call that are viewing this presentation um, first before we started going um, and, and really blitzing the public with, with, our, with our messaging. So we haven't done a whole lot other than a, a couple posts on Twitter um, uh, before making sure that we, we got this information out to folks like yourself. Um, to answer your question, um, 
without doing much awareness or much marketing on our own for this particular program, we've got roughly 50 players who have already filled out a player interest form. Um, so, you know, we're going <laughs> to, we might have an issue on our side when it comes time for uh, player ID dates, but that's a problem that I'm, I'm really excited about having and finding a problem for. So, and, um, yeah, and go ahead. to, we wanted to, we were also very intentional about waiting until club tryouts were completed because again, we don't feel that we, and we really don't want anyone to feel that they have to choose our program over a club. Um, it's completely additive, uh, you know, and to that point, we want to be working with club coaches. We want to be working with high school. We want to work with all coaches to say, what do you think that your player needs to work on? Would you like to come out to a training? Would you, you know, and be really collaborative in that? Because, it, and, and this is the opinion of myself and Jeremiah and John certainly is that there just isn't enough of that right now in the soccer landscapes and even in the Minnesota uh, soccer community. Let's work together to make our kids better. We don't need to compete. Yeah, and we, we could have delivered this presentation earlier, but like, um, like Adam said, when we looked at the calendar, we wanted to make sure we did it after everybody had their, their club tryouts and the dead week um, before the high school programs traditionally got started up. So that's why we, we had this presentation scheduled for this week. So the last thing uh, as far as how, how you can help us and, and maybe how we can help you a bit is um, if, you, if you go to our website, um, you, can, you can check out um, there's a, fut uh, a future section where we'll be dropping some news on. It's just mplscitysc.com slash futures. It's also in the navigation on the site. You can go there and that'll kind of be the North Star for where we're going to be putting up um, more information that isn't uh, 100 and, or 210 or whatever Twitter characters they allow now uh, for us to, to, to knock out there. Um, and again, I, I cannot stress enough um, how much a collaborative effort we want to make this. So please reach out to us. Um, it doesn't, doesn't matter what the questions are. Um, it doesn't matter what the criticism of it is. If, if you're, you're trying to poke holes in what, we, what, we're, what we're doing, it means that, that there's, there's a reason for that and that we need, to, we need to workshop to make sure this is really singing. So when we do boot it up, that it's, it's, it's really gonna benefit uh, not only the, the players, but like, again, the soccer landscape here in, in our state. And, and you know, if you're not comfortable with reaching out to us and you still want to find more information, um, we've had some teaser conversations with uh, a couple folks that, that run podcasts. Um, I encourage you to go out and listen to those podcasts. We've got the People's Pitch podcast. We've been on, Adam's been on the Protagonist podcast um, talking about this program a little bit. Um, is it the 10,000 Pitches podcast as well? Jeremy's on the call this evening, 10K Pitches. Oh, well, there, well, yes, there you sir. go. <laughs> um, I so yeah, I highly encourage you to go out and listen to that specific podcast that uh, is um, starting to do a great job of profiling the Minnesota soccer landscape. So um, they've asked challenging questions. Um, so if you're uncomfortable reaching out to us, um, check those out. But yes, we want to have conversations um, with you guys uh, to make sure that we're making this as inclusive as possible. All right, next, next slide. So what, what is next? The million dollar question right now. Um, these dates may not mean what they should have meant when we put the presentation together. We all know that uh, there's, a, there's something happening right now in, in the world that we can't control. Um, so initially we had looked at doing some of our pre-identification during the club, the club season and, and going out and watching some players. Uh, that did not happen. We just found out that high school soccer is happening, so we will be able to, fingers crossed, be able to get out and, and watch some players who fill out the interest form um, play. Uh, but we were looking at the, you know, starting the ID sessions in early November, having, you know, three sessions. And then um, from a futures training perspective, that going from November through December and then February through June after that, um, that holiday period. So <laughs> please, uh, 
please bear with us that the, the timing may not uh, completely fall in line with what we have here, but we're going to do our best to stick to that. Um, but we, we also want to make sure that we're being safe, whatever uh, COVID throws at us or anything else that throw, that's thrown at us in the, in the future. So we're going to be mindful of that. So if anything does change, um, you know, we will make sure that, that everyone who needs to know that knows that. Um, but ideally, this is what we're going to try to do from a next step perspective. I guess, I guess, am I, am I closing things off or what are you, you guys saying? You or Adam, who, <laughs> who, wants to, who wants to step up and take the penalty? Uh, I'll go first and I'll let you, you go, Adam. I just want to say thank you. Um, the inclusion aspect of all of this is really important to me. Um, part of my role is, is in player recruitment and, and I have a lot of conversations with, um, you know, college coaches, um, high school club coaches, um, and, you know, even some professional coaches out there. And one of the things that I get back is that um, what we currently have, if you take the futures out of it, is something that's, uh, that's, that's not replicated anywhere, at least at our level and maybe even um, above our level in certain aspects. And, it, and so far it has been successful in, in helping players. I'm not talking about winning games, I'm talking about helping players. Um, seeing kids at any of the division levels in college, um, coming into a program like my, my example I, I mentioned earlier, um, seeing them come into programs well-prepared that's why I do this. And adding this layer of, of a younger age group that we can help expose um, something that's different than maybe what they're currently in, or, but definitely something that we believe will help them because we're putting the best caliber of players that we, that, that we, can, we can find through the trial process and the awareness drift driving process together. Um, it will, it will increase the level of play for those players and then ultimately the things that we do and then um and beyond so i i just want to say thank you to to you in advance for allowing us to to work with your players um if we if we don't already work with them in some capacity um and we really look forward to launching this and and when 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 jeremiah brought this to our club leadership's attention uh the offline conversations where this is it. This is what we what we've been looking for 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 the next step for our club, um, because it's it's going to help us and it's going to help soccer. So that's 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 my close. Thank you so much for for participating, and we look forward to working with you in the future. All right. Thanks everybody. Um, thanks for joining, and uh, we'll be. Uh, I'm going to turn off the recording here. Well, should we have, are there any questions before we stop? I didn't have any come through the chat. Um, and, but certainly if we, if anyone has any questions, you can feel free to unmute and it, uh, or you can put them in the chat and we would be happy to answer any. So while any potential questions might roll in, I'm, I'm going to, um, just build on the question that, um, John asked in regards to the the number of players um, that have already submitted that player interest form. Um, so we talk about roughly 50 players have already submitted that player interest um, form. Um, the profile of those players, so we ask them a couple of questions on that form. Um, one is, how did you hear about Minneapolis City? Why do you want to be part of Minneapolis City? And then what else um, should we know about you? Um, and the responses um, have, have really run the spectrum of the entire demographic that we have ac across the Twin Cities. We've got, we've got those players from Minnetonka who play for, you know, the, uh, the big club in the Western cities um, that have had the opportunity to go to Barcelona and play in Germany and things like that. And so we've had those players, but then on the other end of the spectrum, we've had those players who go to a St. Paul magnet school and they don't have, they, they say this as part of the, uh, uh, the form, uh, they, their family does not have the funds to be able to um, support them to play club soccer, but it's all they do. 
um, and they've achieved some success in some of the the, the ethnic leagues um, at, at an adult level. So they're, they're, the, the responses that we're getting already as, as part of that player interest form is really helping us um, validate that what we're setting up here is helping solve the four problems that um, we stated at the beginning of this presentation, so. Any questions roll in during my ramble, Adam? Uh, no, uh, I've just had a few people comment that it's been very comprehensive. So I think we've covered covered everything, potentially. Oh, here we go. Uh, is it a true U19 program from, from Greg or would there be college freshman or softwares that uh, could be could be in this program as well? Jeremiah, do you have any thoughts on that? Sure. Why don't I why don't I address um, part of that? And I'm pretty sure you have thoughts on it as well. So um, we've modeled this program to be a U20 program, so 20 and under. Um, so that is our focus. Um, uh, the players that would probably be part of it are probably on the upper spectrum, but there might be the special player that is a little bit younger. Um, and, and Adam might talk about this a little bit more, but there is a minimum cap um, or floor for the age level that we can um, bring players in. And that would be age 16. So, and that's because of our insurance and Adam could get into that a little bit more. Um, you would have to be a really, really special player um, at age 16 and those players do exist and they those players do need this hyper competitive environment to continue to move forward um, at age 16 but we're looking at age 16 to 20 because we are not affiliated with a traditional US soccer or uh, this is really a unique program we have the flexibility to do a lot of things. So when we bring players in, it's going to be a U20 player into the Minneapolis City Futures. When we get to the, uh, the Futures friendlies and maybe even some of the league matches, um, we're Minneapolis City, so sometimes we just kind of do whatever we want. Um, so we might bring in an overage player to play on one of those teams because we feel maybe one or a handful of those players might need the experience of playing side by side with an older player. Um, and that could happen at the, uh, the futures friendlies level. It could happen at the league level. So um, we've got that flexibility. So I, I don't know if I fully answered your question other than saying. Um, yeah. We'll see. And, and with Greg, you know, Greg was asking like college freshmen or sophomores that are interested. Certainly. Um, you know, most college freshmen, sophomores are, are within that 19, 20 age group. And I would even venture that if there's, you know, I mean, we're not going to turn away a deserving 21 year old. Um, you know, the, the ages are somewhat flexible. Um, it, it, it's all about who's deserving, um, who has the drive, who has the intrinsic motivation, um, and who this program is right for. So um, if the talent level is there and, and, they're, uh, and they're a good kid, then we're going to try to get them in. The one thing I'll add um, when, you, when you bring college into the equation is um, some of the dates that we have for certain things may not be compliant with uh, the rules we have to follow. So um, we, we may have to, to make some adjustments there, but we will be mindful of that to make sure that we're compliant which we do at the first and second yeah. team level all the time, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Thanks, Craig. Does anyone else have any questions? You can feel free to put in the chat. You could even unmute yourself and scream at us. Oh, I, I just got an alert on my phone that somebody um, submitted a player interest form while we're sitting here. Nice. <laughs> that was me, Jeremiah. <laughs> oh, are you signing yourself up, John? No. He just wants the free gloves. <laughs> yeah. Of course he does. <laughs> I, I, I do have a question, and, and I don't – I'm not trying to um, – it's been a great presentation, and I think it's a really good contribution to the soccer community. Is there any thought to what Minnesota United might be on launching 
um, that could maybe be a part of this equation, if that makes sense? Or is it is that not a is that not something that concerns you? Yeah, John, I can, and, and that's a great question. There was a little bit of information that came out today, um, and and to be to be very explicit, like we've sat down with Minnesota United and had conversations with them. Um, and, and so again, we, we even work with them at a higher level to say, we want to be additive in this space, whether it's, you know, at, 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 a, at the top tier, which is MLS in this country, um, to the youth club model, to college, to high school, um, and, and, and resoundingly, Minnesota United agrees that we are additive in this space and that we, we, are, we hold a really high value. Um, and so um, there will be certain players that are better suited for, that, for a Minnesota United model. There's going to be a lot of players that are b better suited for our model. Um, and, and we just, again, I think it's, uh, you know, that the tide kind of lifts, lifts all all ships here, and we're going to kind of work together to make sure that we make Minnesota soccer the best it can be. Yeah, and I think it's also important to reiterate that this is something that we've been working on for a year and a half. Um, you know, a lot of things at the Development Academy, a lot of things with Minnesota United, those have all been fairly recent developments, um, but we've been kind of heads down, full steam ahead on trying to put something together that is um, going to be consistent and sustainable for the long term. Um, so, you know, we're, we're really concentrated on what we're doing. And if, if, if there's other, if there's other markets or other, other teams somewhere um, that, you know, want to have a conversation about the model that we're putting together, that's the ultimate form of flattery. Um, if they want to mimic or mirror or, or copy what we're doing, you know, that's great. Um, like like we've all said in this presentation, we're we're all just trying to make Minnesota soccer better. That's a great question. Okay. Mm -hmm. Kind of last call for any questions. All right. And again. You know the the emails are up here. That's the easiest way to get a hold of us. Um, you can certainly we'll make our phone numbers available through that uh, medium. And you know we just want to stay in conversation with everyone. I want to thank everyone for taking some time out of their evening to join us. Um, any last words, John and Jeremiah? No, thank you. Thanks everybody for taking the time. Thanks everybody for everything that they do individually to make Minnesota soccer better. And we're just trying to add a little bit, uh, a small part to kind of augment that. So thank you. All right, have a great evening, everyone. Thank you thank for you. joining us.